The Vape Passion Show, episode 14. Hey everybody, welcome to the show. I hope you're all doing well. I've been super busy myself. Last week I went to the Big Industry Show. It was a convention here in Denver, Colorado, and it was a mix of the marijuana industry and vaping industry. It was mostly the marijuana industry, but there were still quite a few vendors there I I talked to. I talked to a lot of people. Everyone was really nice. I got a lot of stuff to review. For example, I got a wood skin. These are real wood skins that uh, you place on your mod. They pretty much support all of the latest devices. This one is for the iStick 100 TC, which I'm really happy to get because the paint is chipping so bad on that mod that I really want it to look nice again. So this is going to be cool. I'd also talk to folks at Charlotte's Web. This is CBD. Uh, I know a lot of my listeners or viewers are probably not going to be interested in something like this, but I was really interested because I've I've just been interested in CBD for a while. I've never tried it before. I don't smoke weed. I don't really, I don't like the way it makes me feel. I'm not really against smoking weed, but I don't like it personally. But I am interested in CBD for its beneficial properties. For example, pain relief and sleep. So anyway, I'm excited to try those. I also talked to the guys at nicotinepicks.com. They sell these toothpicks that have nicotine in them. The flavor in these are really strong. I was chewing on the toothpick for like 30 minutes and it still had a lot of flavor. So a lot better than nicotine gum if that's something that you use. I actually sought these guys out because I was looking in the convention guide. That idea of nicotine toothpicks really interested me. So I went to go talk to them myself and uh, they hooked me up with three bottles, different flavors, peppermint, cinnamon, and spearmint. And they also sell energy picks. So these have B12 and caffeine in them. I've used one and... I'm not sure if I noticed a difference or not. Uh, I'll use them again and and, uh, see how they work. As for the nicotine picks, they are three milligrams nicotine and I definitely felt the nicotine. What's cool about them is that you can just keep it on the side of your cheek and if you need a little bit of nicotine, you can just bite into it and it'll come out. So pretty cool. And then I talked to a bunch of e-juice companies, for example, Mad Hatter. So they have a, a new e-juice coming out called I Love Taffy uh, that's not out yet. I think they said in two weeks. It's p- pretty good. They had it there at the booth so I could try it. Uh, they also hooked me up with some of their other flavors. And then Marina Vape, they had some really good flavors. They have a whole bunch of flavors and they're all really sweet and really good. I really like sweet e-juices. So they hooked me up with some e-juices and I got a whole bag full of e liquid so I've got enough to last me a while now. You'll start seeing reviews coming out for those soon. I also took my GoPro. I recorded a lot of video. I don't know if I'm gonna do anything with it. I, I recorded it just in case if I got anything interesting. I might publish it. There were some interesting things there, some, some good discussions I had with people. So I'll take a look. There's a lot of footage to go through, so that might take me a while, but we'll see. Some other notable vendors that I had uh, talked to there were strawberryqueen.com. They were probably my favorite e-juice that I tried there. They weren't, they didn't have any samples to give out so unfortunately I don't have any to review but it was so good. She produces only four different flavors and all of them are strawberry related. They were all really really good. I couldn't believe how good that strawberry flavor was and how different they were from each other even though they were strawberry. There was fresh picked strawberries, there was a strawberry and menthol I believe, a strawberry jelly filled donut, and strawberries and cream. And she mentioned that that she's not selling them on her website yet but she does plan to very soon so as soon as those go up I I think I'm going to order some because they were really good. And another company who I talked to was hotcakesejuice.com. They had two flavors. I think it was blueberry and strawberry. Those were also really good. Those two companies there really stuck out to me from the whole show. And also, like I mentioned, I had talked to a lot of people and I got a lot of vendors asking me if if they could be on the podcast or on this, on the Vape Passion show. You know, I had to tell them that I don't do interviews, but it just got me thinking like, is that something that I should do? Is that something you guys would be interested in? Personally, I don't feel like I'm a very good interviewer. I don't know if I would ever do something like that, but yeah, I I think it it might be a good idea. So yeah, that was the show. It was really good. I had a lot of fun and uh, I hope I get to go again next year. So for some other things going on with me, my podcast is now on Google Play Music. I kind of mentioned it in my last episode at the very end. I don't know if any of you caught it, but if you... Do use Google Play Music. You can find the podcast there now if you want to listen to it there. And in the past week, I I have published a couple of reviews. Both of them were for Vapecraft Inc. Uh, One was for Strawberry Custard, and one was for OMG So Good, which is a dessert vape with custard, vanilla, and cheesecake flavors. 
Both of those were actually really good. Vapecraft Inc. is a budget brand, so you can get those for $3 for a 15 ml bottle, which is a, an amazing price. But the problem is that both of those flavors have questionable ingredients. They have acetylpropanil and acetoin. Neither of those are flavors that I want to vape, so I couldn't recommend them, but the flavors are good. Okay, so before I get into some of the news from the past week, I wanted to talk about how to secure your vaping gear from small children. So I have a two-year-old who is too young to get into my stuff right now, but as she gets older I want to be sure that she doesn't get a hold of my mods or e-juice. E so with that in mind, I started thinking about ways I could secure some of my stuff. So the first thing that came to my mind is the 100 milligram nicotine that I use for DIY. Uh, I don't DIY that often, but I do have it. Right now it's stored in my freezer in my garage, which has a lock on it, so I'm not worried about that. But what about e-liquid and batteries? So I don't have any e-liquids that don't have child safety caps on them, and I've never seen any that don't, but I still wouldn't want my daughter to get her hands on one when I'm not looking. So right now, I have my e-juice stored in little plastic storage containers sitting on my desk right here next to me. Uh, she can't reach it yet, but as she gets older, you know, she could get into there. So I'm gonna have to think about what to do about that. I was thinking one thing I could do is put them up in my closet where she can't reach. But you know, as she gets older, eventually, that's not going to work anymore either. So some other options might be metal toolboxes because those have latches that you can lock. You can put locks on those. I've also heard that there are lockable tackle boxes. I couldn't find any with a quick Google search, so I don't know if that's an option, but that would be nice with all the little compartments. Uh, there are also lockable filing cabinets, and I think that would actually be a really nice option because you could put a ton of stuff in a filing cabinet. A more expensive option would be a safe. Um, I think that's a little much. I don't want to spend the money on a safe anyway. I'd probably choose one of the other options before going there. And I was doing some searches and I came across a company called vaults.net. That's vaults with a Z. They sell like lockable storage cases, small cases. So uh, they have like boxes and suitcases and also like CD styled zip up cases that you can lock. So those might be a good option for things that you want to keep around nearby. So those, those are just some of the things that I was thinking about and that I came across as I was searching. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, if you if any of you out there have kids, what do you do to keep all your stuff away from your kids? Do you just keep it up high or do you lock it away? Do you have something that uh, I didn't think about? I'd, I'd really be interested to hear your thoughts. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's get into some news. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about here is a survey. It's titled the United States Vapor Survey from nicotinesurveys.org, which was put together by the Center for Substance Use Research in the UK. The purpose of the survey is to get input directly from the vaping community in hopes that regulators will listen to our stories before making decisions about making laws against vaping. So I took the survey myself. It took about 15 minutes. It took me a little bit longer than it probably, probably would take you just because I compiled all the questions and all my answers and I published them on my website so if you want to look at the questions before you take the survey or if you want to if you're just interested in learning more about my thoughts about vaping and my habits and things like that that's on my website now if you want to take a look at it I do recommend that you take part in the survey because the more people we can get to answer the survey the more data we have to help us in this fight for vaping. All right, so let's get into some science and research stuff. So this is probably the biggest story of last week. It was everywhere. Everyone was talking about it. There were seven top international tobacco control experts who are prompting the FDA to have a, a more open-minded perspective when it comes to regulating electronic cigarette products. These are all well-respected PhDs from various universities around the world, and they published their thoughts in the journal Addiction on April 25th, and this contained their thoughts based on all of the evidence published to date on e-cigarettes. In that journal, they had suggested that the use of e-cigarettes can help reduce cigarette smoking overall and have potential reduction in deaths from cigarette smoking. The lead author, David Levi, he was quoted as saying, We're concerned the FDA, which has asserted its right to regulate e-cigarettes, will focus solely on the possibility that e-cigarettes and other vapor nicotine products might act as a gateway to cigarette use. We believe that, that the discussion to date has been slanted against e-cigarettes, which is unfortunate because the big picture tells us that these products appear to be used mostly by people who already are or who are likely to become cigarette smokers. Also in that report, they point out that cigarette smoking rates have fallen more in the last two years than they have in the previous four or five years, and this trend seems to coincide with the increase in e-cigarette use. They're warning the FDA that heavy regulation and taxation of e-cigarettes will counteract the benefit that these products can provide. And they also mention that by taxing e-cigarettes, it will discourage youth from using them, but it will also discourage 
used by smokers. And, you know, that's not a good thing. We need to keep these taxes at a reasonable level, especially for people who have lower socioeconomic status. So this is really good news, and I'm really glad that all of these major publications are picking it up. Not just vaping-related publications, but publications everywhere. This is really what the vaping community needs right now. Okay, moving on. So there was a user on Reddit who published a big list of independent studies that back the notion that vaping is less harmful than smoking. He put all of these studies into a Google Doc, a spreadsheet. So, so if you're looking for a study that shows the benefits of vaping over smoking, this is a great list to look to. And in addition to that, eResearch Foundation and the American E-Liquid Manufacturing Standards Association updated a citations list that they keep, which has over 900 citations. These are all research citations, a ton of studies, and now these aren't all pro-vaping, they're, they're all related to, to vaping in some way. If there's a study that you want to reference or, or if you're interested in looking up something in regards to vaping, go to this uh, PDF document, do a search, and if it exists, you'll probably find it. They say that it's not completely comprehensive, but it's probably one of the more or most comprehensive lists that have been compiled and publicly posted. So that's a really useful resource, and I imagine I'll probably be coming back to this pretty often. Okay, and then there's this post from Dr. Michael Siegel. He posted a, an article titled, Anti-Smoking Groups Are Not Capable of Telling the Truth. Now they're telling vapors that e-cigarette aerosol contains propylene oxide, a carcinogen. So what's going on here is that just recently, the Kenosha Racine and Walworth County's tobacco-free coalition made claims that when propylene glycol is heated into vaporized form, it's chemically changed into propylene oxide, which is a class 2B carcinogen. Other groups have, have been saying the same thing. So if you dig into where this originated from, it seems like they're, they're quoting this from an article written by Dr. Stan Glantz, where he pretty much said the same thing. And if you dig even deeper, you find where Dr. Glantz found it, and this comes from a research article that states, under certain conditions, heating propylene glycol can result in the formation of propylene oxide. But that key word there is certain conditions. If you read the research and you find out what those certain conditions are, that would be that the temperature has to be at least 980 degrees Fahrenheit. So propylene glycol, that boils at 371 degrees Fahrenheit, and e-liquids are not heated to that temperature. Now. The coils might go to that temperature, but they're not going to get the propylene glycol to that temperature. So in reality, it's just not possible for that to happen. And something else that Dr. Siegel points out here is that Dr. Glantz and all these other anti-smoking groups, they're hiding the fact that propylene oxide is present in tobacco smoke. It's really disgusting what these people are doing. They're, they're keeping people away from products that could be saving their lives. Okay, anyway, let's get into the section of my show where I talk about news regulations, laws, and the government. So the first one here is more positive news in regards to vaping. This one is in regards to comments made by Mitch Zeller. He's the director of the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. So he was at the 2016 NATO show in Las Vegas from April 19th to the 21st, and he started talking about nicotine, and he was quoted as saying that it's time to start looking at nicotine differently. He said that includes recognizing that there's a continuum of nicotine-containing products, understanding that people smoke for the nicotine but die from the tar, and acknowledging the public health opportunity to move tobacco users down the risk spectrum. So he did say that it's a complicated concept because nicotine is not a completely safe compound and it's never safe for non-users or for youth. Now I would completely disagree with that. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's safe for youth, but I think to say that it's never safe for non-users is untrue. In my belief, it's not a very harmful chemical. Obviously it would be in high concentrations, but just to use it normally in the levels that we use it as, it's I think it's completely safe. But anyway, he goes on to say that there are safe delivery systems for nicotine like gums, patches, and lozenges. And then he was quoted as saying, are we having the wrong debate? For me, yes. The debate has been about e-cigarettes when it should be about nicotine. And he says that there are some critical questions that we need to ask about nicotine, and that would be, what is the longer term use for people who need it? Is there a potential need for a period of dual use? And if there is, how long? What are the unintended consequences of using nicotine? And where does the principle of harm reduction come in? So this is really great because he wants to take the debate away from electronic cigarettes and instead talk about nicotine. And you know, I'd like to think that that's a better thing. I don't agree with everything that he's saying, but it's good to hear that he wants to stop debating about e-cigarettes being a bad thing. Okay, moving on. So CEI, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and CASA have partnered together to file a lawsuit challenging a recent U.S. Department of Transportation regulation that bans the use of electronic cigarettes on airplanes. So their claim is that the lawsuit alleges that DOT has no authority to issue such a ban. They say that Congress never gave regulators the power to prohibit e-cigarette use aboard aircraft and that 
the DOT is inventing authority it clearly does not have. Anyone concerned about government overreach should be worried about this kind of abuse of power. So before that ban came into effect in mid-February, airlines were free to voluntarily prohibit vaping aboard their aircraft. And most of them did, and even if this law didn't go into effect, most of them prob probably still would, if not all of them. But the point is, is that the DOT is overreaching their authority. They don't have the authority to do this, and we shouldn't allow our government to do something like this. So whether or not this has any impact on the law that has already passed, I think it's good to show the government that we're not just going to let them do whatever they they want. Okay, so in some bad news for Washington State, they have become the first state in the U.S. to re require specific labels on e-cigarettes and vaping products. Governor Jay Inslee signed the bill, SB 6328, on April 19th. That bill will go into effect on June 28th. So here are some of the things that that bill is going to do. It's going to require child-resistant packaging. It's going to require the disclosure of nicotine level and warning labels. It requires retailers to be licensed and that they check identification at the point of sale. It prohibits the sale of products from open display cases. It regulates internet and distributor markets, provides enforcement and penalties for retailers who break the laws. It increases tobacco retailer fees and fines. It bans the use of vapor products in schools, school buses, and 500 feet from schools. It allows local bans in indoor spaces and most outdoor areas where there are children. And it allows the Department of Health and local health departments to analyze and seize products and shut down stores when human health is at risk. So not all of those things are bad, but a lot of them are. And if Washington hasn't already closed enough businesses down, here we go with more regulations that will probably shut even more of them down and make vaping products harder for people to get, people who want to quit smoking. All right, so let's move on to the next story. This one is from VaporVanity.com. It's titled, These 19 Representatives Voted to Take Away Your Vaping Rights. So if you remember the, the Tom Bishop bill that was just passed, or the Tom Bishop Amendment, which essentially saves 99% of the vaping products on the market right now from being banned. This article names the 19 representatives who voted against that bill or that amendment. So I think the takeaway from this post is that if your representative from your state is on this list, you should try and get in contact with them and tell them your story and tell them why vaping is so important to you and to everyone else. And hopefully in the future they are more reasonable when voting for or against vaping regulations. Okay, now some positive news around the country. So there was a public hearing on risk reduction and damage associated with addictive behaviors. This was at the French Ministry of Health building in Paris, and about 30 experts were invited. And the outcome of that is an official report written by the hearing committee in charge of recommendations. The report was released on April 19th, and it recognizes that electronic cigarettes are a complementary tool for risk reduction. The report also talks about the author's concerns regarding the TPD that could threaten the electronic cigarette industry. And it said that it would be very damaging if the e-cigarette was threatened by the, the new European directive on tobacco products, since electronic cigarettes are not such a product. And they warned that under this directive, it would significantly hinder innovation and promote the electronic cigarettes marketed by the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry being the only ones who can really comply with a lot of the rules of the TPD. So yeah, good news in France, and hopefully regulators listen to it. All right, and this next one here, I don't know if you remember, uh, recently, there was a story about a 14-year-old boy who went to a, a kiosk inside of a mall and tried out a, an electronic cigarette. It exploded in his face, um, he's got injuries, and he's blinded in one of his eyes. So this is an update to that story. So now one of the owners of the kiosk is saying that the boy is at fault. So this company named Vape On, the co-owner, Esther Kanchik, she claims that no one gave him anything, that he picked up the employee's device, switched out the tank without permission, and then used it. She says that they were never selling to underage people, and that they feel really bad for what happened to this 14 year old boy but to slander her husband's name is really wrong so interestingly they had already fired this employee but they still insist that the kid took the the vape without consent the couple the two owners they also claim that mall security cameras and eyewitnesses will help corroborate their claims but for some reason all four security cameras were unplugged the attorney for the 14 year old thinks that the owners are trying to shift responsibility away from themselves because their kiosk insurance had lapsed so they didn't even they don't even have insurance right now and to say that all four security cameras were not plugged in uh, that's kind of strange. The lawyer is also saying that the kid, he was with his friends, and they can corroborate that the clerk was showing him the products. So things aren't really looking too good for the owners anyway, because NYDailyNews.com, they dug up some information showing that Igor Kanchik, one of the owners, has a prior criminal conviction for being involved in a ring selling illegal bath salts. 
He was one of the 15 people who were arrested for selling over $2 million worth of illegal stimulants in shops all over Manhattan and Brooklyn. He paid an $1,100 fine and was sentenced to two years of probation. So yeah, I don't really know who's at fault here. The owner sounds a little shady. I shouldn't really pass judgment until, you know, everything is said and done, but I hope if the owners really are at fault that they are charged because you know, it's really sad what happened to that kid. Okay, so let's move into the tips and tricks section of the show. I only have a couple of things to mention here. One of them is an article titled Squonk Mods, the Vaping 360 Guide to Squonking. So if you don't know what a squonk mod is, it's a mod where the bottle is placed inside of the vaporizer and you squeeze the bottle to push e-juice up into the atomizer, which is really good for people who like RDAs because it's kind of a pain to have to drip your RDA all the time, especially when you're out and about. And that's why usually when I'm out, I use a tank because I don't want to deal with a dripper. But this article talks about what a squonk mod is, how it works, uh, a little bit about their history, what you need to know about buying a squonk atomizer, and where to get them. And there's also a list of, of pretty well-known squonking RDAs. And they also mention here the Kanger Drip Box, which just came out recently in the last couple of months. It's a really affordable squonking device and probably a good place to start if you just want to get into entry-level uh, squonking. I don't own any squonking devices myself, and I was actually thinking about buying one of these because I think you can get them for like 30 bucks now, which is really cheap. Because um, normally squonking devices and squonking RDAs are pretty expensive. Um, upwards of $100 or even more. So I, I am thinking about getting one. The only thing holding me back is that I'm not a big fan of Kanger products. I don't think they put out good devices. For example, if you look back at my review of the K-Box 200, the paint is all chipping off. There was like a two second delay. It just didn't seem like a very high quality device. I kind of liked the way it looked and the form factor and everything, but there are just better devices on the market. And I worry that if I did buy the Kanger Drip Box that I might feel the same way, that I would have wished I bought something better. But you know, $30 is pretty good. I might get it anyway, just to see what it's all about. Because people who buy Squonkers, they're, they're really into it. So anyway, check that article out. They also have a list of links where you can get in touch with people who sell squonk gear. So they've covered pretty much the basics of, of everything that you need to know about it. All right, and this last one here is an LED flashlight head that connects uh, using a 510 pin to whatever mod you want to connect it to. So this is on Fast Tech. You can get it for only $6.87. That's really cheap. And it almost makes me wonder, you know, how long it would really last. I did look at some of the reviews. I saw one person saying that he tried it on a few mods and it, it didn't work, but then tried it on his Caravella clone and, and then it did work. Another person I saw they had bought it just in case mods are ever banned on planes. Another person said that he bought two of them. Uh, one of them worked for a few minutes. It was really bright and then it stopped working entirely. And then uh, another good tip here from someone, he mentioned that the spring-loaded positive pin is, is really soft and has no tactile feedback. So if you're using a hybrid mech mod, it's really easy to tighten it down to where the positive pin and the negative threads touch the battery. So you really shouldn't use it on a mech mod. It's it's too dangerous. But yeah, I thought it was just a fun product and really cheap. You know, I would, I'm thinking about getting one just because it's only $7. And if they ever do ban mods on planes, you know, what, what are they going to tell you? You can't take a flashlight on the plane? You know, that's a, a pretty neat idea. Okay, so that's going to do it for this episode. You'll find the show notes on vapepassion.com. Uh, if you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page. You can find that at patreon.com slash vapepassion. You'll find a link on my website there too if you want to just go there. You can follow me on Twitter at vapepassion. I'm also on Facebook and YouTube. And if you'd rather listen to this in audio format, you can listen on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. And that's going to do it for me. So I hope to see you all again next week.